This episode is sponsored by Dr. Chrono by EverHealth, the number one mobile all-in-one EHR. Built specifically for medical practices, Dr. Chrono includes an integrated feature that powers a seamless payments acceptance experience. Dr. Chrono Payments offers multiple ways for patients to pay as well as insurance credit card processing. As a Dr. Chrono customer, you can easily activate our fully integrated payment solution that will streamline your cash flow and help you get paid anytime from anywhere. Deliver the best patient experience with a fast and easy way to collect payments. Visit drchrono.com forward slash payments. That's drchrono.com forward slash payments to learn more about Dr. Chrono today. Direct primary care is an innovative alternative path to insurance driven healthcare. Typically, a patient pays their doctor a low monthly membership and, in return, builds a lasting relationship with their doctor and has their doctor available at their fingertips. Welcome to the My DPC Story podcast, where each week you will hear the ever so relatable stories shared by physicians who have chosen to practice medicine in their individual communities through the direct primary care model. I'm your host, Marielle Conception, family physician, DPC owner, and former fee-for-service doctor. I hope you enjoy today's episode and come away feeling inspired about the future of patient care, direct primary care. So I'm excited to be on this podcast because I love DPC. It allows me to practice in ways I never thought I could. But more importantly, I really want to share this with younger doctors. I'm sort of older and at the end of my career, but really hope to help other doctors discover this new way and help them sort of create the practice that they could have never imagined. I'm Dr. Matthew Mintz. I'm an internal medicine primary care physician in Bethesda, Maryland, and this is my DPC story. Dr. Matthew Mintz is a board-certified internist. He practices in Bethesda, Maryland, and provides old-fashioned, personalized care with today's advanced diagnostic procedures and treatments. He serves patients in the cities surrounding Bethesda, including Potomac, Rockville, Chevy Chase, and the larger Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia areas. Named one of Washingtonian Magazine's top docs since 2012, Dr. Mintz received his medical degree from George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, D.C. After 20 years practicing medicine and teaching as a full-time faculty member at George Washington University, Dr. Mintz decided to open his own practice in Bethesda. Dr. Mintz is affiliated with and has privileges at George Washington University Hospital in Washington, D.C. and Suburban Hospital in Bethesda. He has researched and published articles on chronic diseases such as asthma, diabetes, COPD, and obesity. He is an active educator and personality for local media as well. Dr. Mintz continues to serve as clinical associate professor teaching at the medical school and having George Washington medical students learn in his office. Dr. Mintz emphasizes traditional healthcare values where every patient is a person and not simply a case. Dr. Mintz restores the idea of the personal care physician who has a relationship with each patient, removing the frustration that often accompanies contemporary health care. Dr. Mintz grew up in Montgomery County, Maryland, and graduated from Churchill High School. He currently lives in Rockville, Maryland with his wife and two teenage daughters. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Mintz. Thank you. It's great to be here. Going back to your opening statement, I know that you are definitely a few steps ahead in terms of your training and your practice years, but I will say, I hope you're not at the end of your journey just because you have such an amazing story and all of the things you've continued to achieve past your life in fee-for-service, I think it's amazing. And so I I just want to drop that there as we start. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. No, I've definitely got a a few more years to this. I, I don't plan on retiring anytime soon. But I definitely, this is something that I did late in my career. Had I done it earlier, I probably would have done things a little bit differently. But no, most people at 50 years old don't just like start a new practice. So it's a little bit unique. I'm going to guess that if Dr. Tom White is listening to your episode today, he's like, yes, you go. So 
Well, no, with that, with you mentioning how you are very passionate about educating and inspiring the next generation of DPC doctors and the generation after them, I want to ask you, looking back to your life after residency, what did that look like for you in terms of what was on the horizon? Private practice, group practice only, what did it look like? Well, actually, that's really a good place to start because it, it sort of it, it explains sort of how I got where I was for up till this point, because I knew that I loved primary care. I had dabbled with the idea of maybe doing specialty medicine, but I really just liked too many things. I did my medical school at George Washington University. I'm from the Maryland suburbs and wanted to stay local for medical school. And GW was one of the few programs that actually had a primary care residency. So it was internal medicine, primary care residency. Back then, a million years ago, most internal medicine training was all inpatient. You got very little outpatient training. And so there were some primary care internal medicine residencies that had developed. Fast forward, things have changed. You haven't seen new primary care programs. What you've seen is the categorical medicine residencies have just adopted, and now they're doing more like 50% outpatient. But at the time, it was really unique. So I stayed, did my residency at GW in primary care internal medicine, and wasn't exactly sure. This is at you know the end of the 90s, where there was a lot of upheaval. People were talking about managed care, and the PCP was going to be the gatekeeper, and it was going to be all different. I was a little bit skeptical. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And they asked me to be chief resident and for medicine, chief residents an extra year. And to me, that was a good stalling technique because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And sometime during my senior residency, you know, chief residency decided I really like this academic stuff. I really like this teaching stuff. I like this environment. And so I stayed on as faculty after chief resident for 20 years. And so I was full-time academic for 20 years at the George Washington University. And I did a lot of different things. One of the things I actually was starting, I thought I was going to do clinical research, but a lot of things happened and I wound up in education very, very early. And so I did a number of things while I was there. I was the primary care clerkship director for about a decade. I got involved in our clinical skills course. We had a um, problem-based learning component of our clinical skills course. So I directed that for a number of years. Then I took over the entire clinical skills course for a number of years. And then about several years before I left, the dean of the medical school asked me to come over to the medical school as dean to basically lead our curricular revision. So the last four so years that I was there, I was actually in the dean's office doing mostly medical school curriculum stuff. So so I guess I got scared of what the real world was, ended up academics and really had a very sort of 20 year academic run being very involved in academic medicine. And I, again, though, I can really see how you're so passionate about continuing to inspire the next generation in this case of, of physicians practicing in the direct primary care model, because you have such a strong history already of inspiring so many primary care physicians. So I absolutely love that. Now, one of the things that you have mentioned publicly is that you came to a point where you realized that it was really challenging to foresee your family continuing to survive on the salary that you were being paid. And so I want to ask, how did it come to that place? And how did you start realizing this might not be my, my forever job? Mm. Right. So in my mind, it was my dream job because I loved what I did. I got to do research. I got to take care of very interesting patients. I got to work with students, got to work with residents. I got to teach. And then later on, I, I got to develop curriculum. I loved my job. I planned on being there forever. I thought it was my forever job. But there were two things that made that very difficult. The one was I dealt with, but it was hard. It was the commute. So I live in the suburbs of Maryland and my practice was in DC and uh, Washington DC traffic is, is pretty bad. And uh, sort of the one hour plus commute each way for 20 years was, was, was starting to take its toll on me. So, but I probably could have lived with that for a little while longer, but really it was just the salary. I mean, no one goes into primary care because they want to make a lot of money. Okay, we realize that. But I, you know, I grew up and now live in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and I never thought in a million years that I couldn't be a doctor and raise my family living in those suburbs. And again, I don't want to imply that I was living in poverty. We took a vacation every once in a while. I mean, I was able to keep my family fed. 
but we went to public schools, didn't have any fancy cars, didn't go out to dinner. It was it was hard on a primary care physician's salary. Now, one of the things about academics is the, the most underpaid professionals other than primary care physicians are teachers. So primary care physicians don't get a lot of money. Teachers or academics don't get a lot of money. And that intersection is pretty poor. And then you add that living in an area that's a relatively high cost of living, a suburb of a major metropolitan area, the economics of that just didn't work out. So I would have been happy if I could have met and made the ends meet, I would have been happy, but it just wasn't working out. So I was ready to leave about 10 years into my 20 year career. I was ready to leave. I went to my boss, the chair of medicine and said, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm getting in debt. I can't do this anymore. And my boss came up with the idea of starting a concierge practice. And so our, our medical school, our medical institution is not the only one to have ever had a concierge practice, but it was pretty unique. And again, I didn't want to do concierge medicine. That was for like rich people. And I don't want to see that. But the alter I was literally ready to leave. And, and the alternative, starting my own practice without any business experience, this was before I even knew what DPC was, you know, it was very daunting and I wasn't going to be able to teach. And here I basically can keep the job that I love, have an increased salary so that I can stay here for hopefully forever. And, you know, I'll try this concierge thing. So it was a really no brainer because ultimately I wanted to stay at the job I love. The problem was, is that while the salary we agreed on was enough to keep me there, it wasn't enough to keep me there to stay because the idea was the salary would go up over time, but unfortunately that did not happen. So that's why I ended up having to leave ultimately, despite being a concierge doctor and despite being dean of a medical school, I was still making less than the average primary care physician across the country. And I think one day, you know, when my daughter was applying to these colleges and I was looking to where she wanted to go, she wants to be on Broadway. And so we don't have to talk a lot about that. But basically, if you want to be on Broadway, you have to go to one of these colleges that have a musical theater program. It can't just have a good music program or a great theater program. It has to have a good musical theater program. And so my state school didn't have one. And GW, where I would have gotten a faculty tuition benefit, didn't have one. And so I realized that I can't send my kid to where she wants to go to school if I continue to stay. And ultimately, that's what happened. That's why I ended up saying I can't, you know, it was a good 20 year run. I love my job. I hate my commute, but I love my people. I love my job, but I just can't stay here if I want to sort of survive long term. And that's ultimately why I decided that I had to leave. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you to Spruce Health for supporting the My DPC Story podcast. The ways we communicate have changed dramatically over the past decades, but technology and tools in healthcare have not kept pace. Patients want more access and digital convenience, as well as the ability to text their care teams. Care teams are inundated with more communication and rising expectations, but are still using tools and technology stuck in prior decades. Spruce Health created a solution for the tech-forward DPC practice by creating a communication product designed to serve both the patient and the doctor through intuitive HIPAA-compliant workflows, tagging, scheduled messages, and triage templates ready for use, whether you're on your phone or in the exam room. New users get 20% off for the first 12 months of a paid plan with code MARYAL20. That's M-A-R-Y-A-L-2-0. So check out Spruce Health today at sprucehealth.com or check out the link in the show notes. And it's so relatable. And especially when you said like, if they had just done this, I might have stayed. I can relate to that completely. It, yeah, and, and I think one of the differences in my story is that one. I guess I learned early on that that not only did I like the teaching, but one of the things that was good about teaching is it balanced my schedule. So you know, my while early on I saw a lot of patients. Pretty early in my career, I was fifty percent or less clinical. And so while yes, I saw lots of patients. Some of my clinics were resident clinics. So the actual clinic time, while I had that typical burden of the primary care physician seeing all these patients and doing all the charting and the EMR and the stuff that people you know don't like, that was actually for a lot of the time that I was there a small part. So the, to me, the clinical stuff wasn't that bad. I wasn't really complaining about it because I had so many of these other things that I was doing. 
And so, you know, what was interesting about the concierge is that I didn't want to do the concierge. That wasn't anything I was thinking about. It was to me, it was about, I can't, I love this job. I can't afford to stay. This was an opportunity to stay. But what was really interesting is when I started the concierge practice, I learned the value of time that I got to see patients when they need to be seen. I got to spend more time with patients. And what I recognized was that I was delivering better care. It wasn't that I was such a good doctor or better than any of my colleagues at the academic institution. It was that I had time to spend with my patients. I didn't have to refer them. If they needed to me, I could see them or, or, or work with them and maybe keep them out of the emergency room. And I just realized not only was this more fun, like getting to know patients and having that relationship with them, but it was I was delivering better care. And so that was the angst was, you know, well, you're just going to be a concierge doctor and, and only the rich people can see you. And so, but wait, but here's the thing is that is doing 15 minute visits, complex primary care and 15 minute visits. Is that good also? Because, because I know that my colleagues are all very good and they're doing the best they can, but you cannot deliver complex primary care in 15 minutes. You can't do a good job. So everyone who's still on the insurance treadmill, they're doing the best they can, but that's not the same thing as good care. And so that was one of the things, again, because I went into concierge reluctantly, but I realized, wait a second, this is much better. This is a much better way to deliver care and, and get good clinical outcomes. And it's more fun and it's more relaxing and you're not as stressed, but this was just a better way to do it. And so that's sort of what I learned the last several years that I was there, that this was a much better model. And going into the way that the concierge model was set up through your academic position, how did that work technically in terms of was any part of your salary impacted by number of patients seen per day? And how was the the clinic run in terms of, did you have a set number of patients as your maximum number on your panel? Could you give us some more details about how concierge medicine works when an academic center is involved as well? Yes, that's very interesting. And so again, I don't know the numbers of academic centers who do this. My guess it's a small number, but what was interesting, so on the one hand where my boss said, yes, let's have you do a concierge practice, they didn't tell me what to do and how to do it, which has its pros and cons. So we agreed on a salary, okay? So the idea was, is that if I wanted my salary to go up, I would have to see more patients. I would have to get more patients to my panel. They did not do anything at all to help market the practice. They sent out one mailing and that was it. So I was all on my own as far as, you know, marketing, developing the model, et cetera, et cetera. They really, they allowed me to do it, but they didn't really put any money into it. In fact, there was a lot of sort of um, things that came with the deal. So for example, one of the things they had already been doing is executive physicals and they were having challenges with that. So part of the deal that I made was I would take over the executive physicals until I was able to generate enough revenue. My goal was to eliminate that because I didn't like the executive. I don't think that model is a good model for a variety of reasons. So my hope was, is to eventually eliminate that. But because I didn't get a lot of support to grow the practice, I, I wasn't able to do that. And then one of the things that I figured out while I was there through just talking to people is that um, the, the other need that we had was international care. So what I ended up doing actually, because there was patients is I started an international clinic as well. So I had my concierge practice, I had the executive physicals that I was doing, and I started an international medicine practice, all with the goal of sort of trying to build, generate enough revenue so that eventually I could increase my salary, but also get rid of the executive physicals. Because whereas the concierge thing I thought was, this is the way everyone should have, everyone should have a concierge doctor or a DPC doctor, whatever. That's the way it should be. But the executive physicals, I did not like at all. We were contractually obligated to offer 40-year-olds colonoscopies and I ended up, well, I had to do that contractually. I ended up, you know, talking out a number of 40-year-olds out of their colonoscopy that they were, you know, offered. I did not like the executive physical. So eventually the goal was to try to build up these practices so that I could eventually get the salary that would keep me there. And then what happened was the dean asked me to come over to the medical school to revise the curriculum. 
And so I gave up the executive physical. They could let someone else do that. I gave up the international practice. They could let someone else do that. And I basically kept my small panel of concierge patients while I was dean. So the last few years that I was there, I was basically 80% dean. And then I would run over to the clinic any one time one of my concierge patients needed to be seen. Gotcha. And just for clarity, when you say executive physical, what does that mean, generally speaking? Right. So this is a model that is usually seen as a corporate perk. So the idea is you're a busy CEO or top C-suite executive. You're busy, so you don't have time to see the doctor. Okay. But you're also a, a, a big value to the company that you work for because replacing you if you get sick and die would be very expensive. So a lot of companies will offer these executive physicals. It's not primary care, and that's the, the problem, but it's sort of a, you go to the doctor, you spend a day or half a day there and get everything done in one shot. You do all your screenings, vision screening, hearing screenings, pulmonary function tests, cardiovascular screening like stress tests, mammograms, colonoscopies, It's sort of a everything in one shot deal talking about sort of all your care in sort of one day. And, you know, it's a pretty high price and they pay for that. And so prior to me coming or prior to me doing this, our institution had started one of these executive physical type clinics. And again, we're not the only academic institution that does this. And actually it didn't work out well, except for one contract that we had. And so that was going okay. And so they asked me to take over that. And while I didn't hate it, these young executives were, you know, nice to talk to and interesting. I didn't feel like I was doing good medicine. I was doing more than needed to be done. I mean, again, I'm academic, so I'm trained on evidence-based medicine and we don't do tests unless they need to be done or there's value and proof. And this was sort of the opposite of what my training was. And while it wasn't unpleasant, I just, it wasn't the kind of medicine that I wanted to practice. Yeah. And as you're explaining the overview of an executive physical is you're talking about like the importance of the the person, if they didn't show up to work, I'm like, well, that's every human being who works in America. So that's Mm. funny that direct primary care to me, as you're saying that, yeah, I'm like, you're going through pulmonary function tests, like all these things and labs, if they're needed, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what all of us do for all of our patients as they're needed. So I I love that bridge between you finding out your place in medicine where you wanted to be able to practice the way you wanted to practice, balance the not having to worry about the finances on top of being treated and valued as you should be as a physician. So I want to go into when you were doing concierge medicine, realize the value of time. Did you know that you were leaning into the tenets of direct primary care or had you learned about direct primary care at that time? Good question. So so again, it was about plus or minus halfway through my career. So 10 of the 20 years, I knew that from a, this is again before my kid was going to college, but I just knew that I was not making enough to support my family, save for retirement, et cetera. And I knew that they couldn't pay me anymore So I was starting before I went to my boss to say that I was leaving, I started looking, sort of getting a lay of the land. And so I met with a number of different, because I knew that I was going to do private practice. And even then I knew that insurance-based medicine probably wasn't going to work because I realized that that was why my salary was so low. So I met with a lot of people and I looked at a lot of different models and DPC was maybe it had a name back then, but it was not really there. And so I met with a number of people that were doing either concierge, and again, not necessarily what I, you know, when I think of concierge, I think of corporate concierge, like MDVIP and things like that. I wasn't talking like that. I was talking to some of the early pioneers that were sort of out there and doing it, and they did it in various different ways, and just to see if this was viable. So for example, um, there were some older doctors who, I don't even know if they call themselves concierge doctors. But basically what they did is they did what I call cash fee for service. So in other words, they, you know, they didn't take insurance, but when you got, when you were seen, you pay cash and they would give an invoice and you could submit that to insurance, but they didn't bill insurance. And what they did was, is that that physical, you know, they just charged a lot for that. So the physical was sort of a mini concierge fee and that's how they did it. I talked to one of the very earliest pioneers who I think is just retiring and trying to look for someone to get his practice is Alan Dappen. He was, his clinic was called Doc Talker. And he did it in a way that I don't think anyone has ever done. And that was really unique where he charged like a lawyer. He charged by the minute. 
So like the physical was X number of dollars because it was 60 minutes. And if you needed a prescription call, then he would charge you whatever his rate was, like three minutes. And, you know, he was a real big pioneer, out of the box thinker. And so I met with all these doctors. He was in Virginia. I, I, I sort of traveled. And what I realized was that there, there were a lot of different models out there. No one had sort of figured it out, but this was something that I could do. And so the other thing that was interesting is because I had spent all this time researching and I actually, I don't know if you, it's even online now because it was like 10 years old, but I actually wrote an article for medical economics because I had done all this research. I'm like, I might as well write an article on this because it doesn't exist. And, you know, I can, I'm sure someone like medical economics would publish it and they did all the different models of doing primary care out there because, you know, because I, that article didn't exist for me. So why not write something? So I did that. They, I don't know if you, it's still available because it's at least, you know, we're talking like 15 years old now. But but I, so I was ready to go and I had sort of figured out what my plan was. Am I going to start a DPC? Am I going to do cash fee for service? I just knew that the market was there. It was doable. Others had come before me. So I went to my boss and said, I'm leaving without really a plan. And he came back with the concierge practice. And so I never did that until 10 years later when I realized I couldn't stay. Now, these days, you know, I, I feel that there are a lot more residents who are saying, I'm going to do DPC after residency, which I absolutely love. When you look back on your journey in terms of your mindset to choose to practice on your own, you're pretty confident about, I know I need to do things a different way. And this is, I, I love this idea of having time with patients. In terms of the mindset, when you were then building your ideal practice, what were your intentions and how did you achieve those? Because your transition to direct primary care was within days. So can you can you share a little bit about that part of your journey and your mindset there? So it's very interesting because, again, the, the, the first time I thought about this and I went to my boss and said I was leaving, I had no plan. So so the second time around, I was I, my plan was, is to, so the academic year goes from July to July. I was going to try, I was now in the dean's office, I was going to try to get my contract you know, toward the end of the year to be a reasonable salary that I could stay. And then, so that's in July. So in late March, early April, I found the group, two of the doctors that I had talked to 10 years earlier were ready to sell their practice. And they reached out to me because they wanted to sell their practice. This is in late March, early April. So months before I was, I was still thinking, hopefully I can negotiate, but they wanted to sell their practice and they wanted to sell it now. And I was like, I wasn't quite ready. I wasn't there yet, but like, this is too good of an opportunity to pass up. So I met with these doctors. They they told me sort of how they operated. Again, they were cash fee for service. They I don't even know if they call themselves concierge, but they were essentially a concierge type model, but it was cash fee for service. It wasn't corporate. They were both sort of part-time. And one of the partners had decided they were done. Their lease was up and they wanted to unload this practice as soon as possible. And so I met with them and I was so convinced that this was going to work out that I gave my 90-day notice. And so that was the plan. I was going to take over this practice and basically take it over. I'll use their model and tweak it here and there. There was no overarching ideal plan. And I work with these doctors for about 30 days, looking at over their financials and stuff like that. And ultimately, they wanted too much money. They wanted to sell their practice for too much money. I, I knew from my previous research that I, I could start my practice. I, I would take out a loan or something like that, but they wanted to sell. So they had hired a consultant who told them their practice was worth three quarters of a million dollars and wanted to sell me that for half price and thought they were giving me an incredible deal. And I'm like, for a lot less than that, I could start my own practice. So basically, I basically told them no. And so rather than take my money and I was going to give them a lot of money each, they folded up shop, got not one dime and left. And that was it. And so now I'd already given my 90 days notice. So I had 60 days to start a practice while still working at my busy job. I was curricular dean and seeing patients and it was really hard. It was very, so I actually, I, the, the, what was great about that and what I can share with students is that the residents that want to do this is that it forced me to come, it's forced me to get started without really thinking about it. And that was sort of this blessing. I had 60 days to start a practice. I, I, you know, I'm the only salary. My wife's a teacher. I love her, but she doesn't make a lot of money to support our family. I can't afford to like not be out of job. I need to be up and running quickly. So it didn't give me a lot of time to think, how should I design this? How should I do that? I just like, I had to go. And that was a blessing because I didn't, 
I didn't have time to work. I just had to go, go, go. And what I learned from that, you can just, you, this is not that hard to do. It really isn't. It really isn't that hard to do. Anyone can do it. Now it's scary because they don't, we don't teach you this in medical school. I actually, you know, eventually added some business of medicine in the curriculum. They actually still have me come back which I'm happy to do as long as they'll have me to do the one session that the students get in business and medicine because we didn't have any of this stuff. So it's super scary, especially someone who's out of residency. They don't tell you how to do this, but it can be done. And one of the things I tell younger doctors, and again, this is no disrespect to, to hairdressers or plumbers, but most hairdressers or plumbers have their own business without even a college education. And they do very, very well. You don't, you know, it, what, Passing step one, that's hard. Taking your residency boards, that's hard. Starting a business, it's not that hard. It can be done. And then the other great thing about it is that you don't have to do it all on your own. There's lots of people that can help you do this, some of which you'll pay and it'll be worth it. And some of them, you don't pay a dime. Like, where should I open my practice? Well, there are people there. There are real estate agents, commercial real estate agents that can find you the perfect perfect location and give you all the pros and cons. And guess what? You don't pay them a dime because they make their money on the back end once they rent you that space. So there's lots of things. And so that's what I discovered that, that based out of necessity, I found people who could help me so that I didn't have to do everything, you know? And so, and it really, it can be done. It can be, it's again, it's, an, it's not that it's easy, you know, it's going to take work, but it's not like this impossible thing that you can't do right out of residency. You absolutely can do it. You can do it at any time, any time in your career, it can be done. I did it toward the end of my career and I'm doing okay. So. I love it. And super encouraging. And I'm very glad that you mentioned how as the curricular Dean, that you had the, the viewpoint to say this type of pointing out to people who are smart enough to get into medical school that they can also start a business just like anybody else who chooses to start a business. So I absolutely exactly. love that. And going there, I, I, I want to get into your practice in terms of your details, but I want to I want to segue into the fact that you still have involvement in teaching as part of your daily practice as a physician. And so when you are working with medical students who are coming in and seeing the, your model and how your patients are interacting with you and how they love your value proposition, what are some of the conversations that you have with medical students in terms of are they seeing entrepreneurship is a, a a thing that that they can achieve are they are they learning that early on if they have not yet taken your your business seminar and what challenges are they throwing at you in terms of like oh I couldn't do that because xyz so that's a great question so I, I'm very passionate about having medical students in the clinic especially I, I think all DPC docs should do this for a number of reasons the issue is is that if if everyone starts doing DPC, you know, there's not going to be enough docs to see all the patients. And that's true because we have a lack of primary care physicians. But why do students want to go into emergency medicine? Why to go in medicine subspecialty? Why to go, why don't they want to do primary care? It's because it's not fun. It's because it's a burden and you don't make a whole lot of money. It's not, again, I don't think the students have changed. People going to primary care don't necessarily want to make a lot of money. They want to take care of patients and do a good job and have a life, you know, and be able to feed their family and maybe take a vacation once in a while. Nothing's really changed. And now you can do that. And so to me, it's every time I have a student, I want to let them know. And again, I, we don't, not everyone can be primary care. We need good emergency room docs. We need good surgeons. So I don't try to talk them out of that. But I think as someone who was on the faculty for 20 years, I was on the admissions committee for maybe 15 years. So I spent a lot of time looking at medical student applications. And I can't tell you how many of them said, oh, I want to do primary care and serve the needy and all that stuff. And I don't think that they were lying. I mean, maybe a little bit to get into medical school, but I think they really meant it. And what happens is, is medical school beats out the primary care and altruistic nature of most students because they see what a burden caring for patients are in that setting in our healthcare system. So I think when you get students to say, oh, wait a second, this is primary care, you're going to have a lot more students choosing to do primary care because I get these longitudinal relationships with patients. I have a good lifestyle. I'm making a decent living, maybe not as much as an orthopedic surgeon, but I'm doing okay. And I can have fun and I can have a life. 
and I get these great, and I spend a lot of time with them. And that's why we went into medicine. So I want the students to see that this is possible and one by one try to convert at least some of them into primary care, or at least have them realize that this is a possible career path and not all primary care physicians see 25 patients a day and, and, and are stressed out and have to go do charting at home instead of eating dinner with their family, because that's what they see. Because most of the students, when they do these, you know, whether a preclinical or clinical, they're usually doing it in the academic medical setting when their preceptors are miserable. They're, they're not happy in the clinics. And so that's what they see. So I want them to see that and want them to know that there's an alternative to do that. So that's that's one thing. Awesome. And when you have conversations with your peers who are potentially in positions like you were when you chose to practice on your own or people who are in those first few years out of residency reaching out, for example, like Dr. Jalan Burton, she had looked to transition her own life to a direct primary care model in pediatrics in the DMV area. And she had reached out to you. So when you're talking to peers, what types of conversations do you have there most commonly? That's a good question. There's a lot of things. So what I want to do is be a resource for them and help them. One of the things that, you know, again, for me, I didn't really have, I had to get up and running really quickly. So for one of the things I asked them is sort of, what is their vision? What do they want to do? Because I sort of didn't exactly set it up that way. I just, I tried to create a business model so that I could be up and running very quickly. And I think if I had the luxury to do it over again, I might have done it differently. So what is their vision? What happens is, is that when you're starting out a practice on your own, and especially if you have the luxury of time, like people say, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to have three months or six months to set up a practice, they get very bogged down into the granulars of how am I going to make it work without focusing on what's the big picture. To me, the one thing I tell younger doctors is figure out what your vision is recognizing that that might change over time and figuring out how you might build, starting the practice to build toward that vision, as opposed to figuring out how you're going to generate income from day one. Because to me, that's the most successful way to sort of build and grow a practice is start with a vision and work that way, as opposed to, all right, well, I'm going to just, I have to make some money. So, and I don't want to take any loans. So I'm going to do urgent care five days a week while I slowly build my PPC practice. I don't think that's the right way to go. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Have you tried an AI scribe in your clinic? Well, I've tried so many, and I can say Heidi Health is the best AI scribe I have come across thus far. With Heidi Health, I can create unlimited, customizable templates for my notes to help me truly cut down on the time I'm spending charting. Template for pediatric well child check? Done. Template for weight loss management? Done. Some of my favorite things I've built into my AI template, beyond the general soap note, are having a list of actionables for our team to take after a patient visit, having the diagnoses listed, and creating an after visit summary for our patients. Not only have I found Heidi Health to be the most helpful, customizable AI scribe so far, it's also more affordable than most out there. So try Heidi Health today and see how you can harness the power of an AI scribe for your practice. To get an entire month of Heidi Pro free, go to the homepage of mydpcstory.com and click on the Heidi Health ad. Awesome. So again, I love those words of just taking a step back and thinking about one's vision, because that could pertain to so many aspects in our life, whether it be our business, whether it be how we want to manage schedules, whatever it is with our families. For you, when we talk about you taking your vision for your practice, and yes, you had to transition quickly. I want to say that your last day of full-time faculty was like June 30th. And then the same year on July 5th, you saw your first DPC patient. And so- That's correct. Yeah. So as you're falling while building the plane, so to speak, how did you then create your vision as you went into your second, your third, your fourth, your fifth year? Did you did you stop and as a as a solo doctor, did you stop and say periodically, this is how I'm going to like mentor myself and take time to figure out my vision? So it's interesting because the two are related because I would say that because I wasn't focused on vision, I made mistakes. And that mistake actually led me to sort of the vision that I'm still working on. And that's the other thing, too, is that 
it's not well I, on the one hand i'm saying you know figure out what your vision is and build toward that it's okay that the vision changes so what happened with me is again i had a concierge practice already but because of the distance from my clinic i only had a handful of patients come and follow me and so i started out very slow and I started to get very nervous because I was just going to get it up and running. I wasn't really thinking about, was this going to work or not? And so I was looking, well, how else can I generate revenue while I build and grow this practice? And so one of the things that I did early on, which ended up working out very poorly, was I started to dip my toe into aesthetics, which, and again, there are a lot of DPC doctors that do aesthetics, and I'm not criticizing that because that could be a very good thing. But That wasn't my vision. It was more of, you know, I was thinking there are other things that I can do. I can do legal consulting. I can do other things. And to me, I wanted to, I thought I I had been doing some medical weight loss in my previous academic practice. That was something that I was interested in. So I thought that might be a possibility. And that sort of paired with aesthetics. And so part of it was, is that I was at the, the wrong place at the wrong time. These companies that sell these machines are very, very aggressive. And so they they caught me at a very vulnerable moment and sold me on a machine that would help me build and grow my practice. And it ended up not working out very well, but I learned a lot. And so that was good. And so I, I definitely took a financial hit over time, but you know, it, it, there was some value in it as well. But the other thing that did happen that was good is that, or worked out well, because I was open to new ideas. The aesthetic thing didn't work out, but the other thing that happened was a medical cannabis dispensary moved into my building several months after I had opened. And again, medical cannabis was not in my vision, but I needed a way to generate some revenue. And I'm like, okay, if they want to send me up a couple patients to certify, what's the harm in that? But I found that I really liked it. I was really worried that I, you know, I was going to basically giving people a legal excuse to to use cannabis. So I was skeptical. But what I found out was I'm in Maryland, but I'm near D.C. Recreational cannabis is legal in D.C. So if you just want to get pot, it's very easy to go to D.C. So the people that were wanting medical cannabis were really sick. Stage four cancer, mets to the bones, horrible nausea from chemotherapy, chronic pain, arm narcotics, desperate to get off. And I started seeing these patients and started recommending medical cannabis, and I saw that it worked. And that's what we want to do as primary care physicians, as physicians in general. We want to get people well. And so I ended up really liking this. And I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this the right way, you know, and incorporate it in part of my practice. And again, just like we don't learn about business and medicine in medical school, we didn't learn about medical cannabis other than cannabis is bad and it's a drug and you shouldn't use it. So I had to, you know, learn all this stuff and do some research. And if I was going to do this the right way, and I, again, similarly, I figured if I'm going to, if I put all this time, effort and energy to learning all this stuff, I might as well publish it. So I actually wrote a book, a Medical Marijuana and CBD, A Physician's Guide for Patients, available on Amazon now. Uh, and and actually, because I no, it wasn't out there. There weren't that books for docs. So, so I ended incorporating that into my practice and really liking it. And then going back to vision, And again, I'm still working on this. One of my biggest fears of leaving academia, besides like not being able to support myself and my family, because actually that's not true. When I had investigated this 10 years back and met with people like Dr. Dappen and other people who were successful, I knew that I would be successful. I was worried, but I knew it would work out. For me, the actual issue when I started out the second time was a time factor. Because now my kids were older. My kid's about to go to college in a couple of years. Like, I don't have two, three, four years to be financially successful. I have to get financially successful now because I have college tuition payments coming in a few years. So that's probably what made me do things that I probably shouldn't have done, like, you know, aesthetics. But one of my biggest fears, actually, was that I would be bored. Because one of the great things about academic medicine is you get to do a lot of things. I was doing research, I was doing education, I was doing curriculum. There were all these fun and cool things that I was doing. How am I going to just see patients every day? That's going to be so boring. Like I love primary care, but I've never, except for maybe my first year as faculty 20 years ago, I met that I've always done other things. And was I going to get bored? And one of the things that I found out was I really, not only did I like the medical cannabis piece, but I liked the variety. I like sort of doing other things just besides primary care. The other thing about medical cannabis is I found I'm now a specialist. I'm getting referrals from my colleagues. So I can wear my primary care hat on and my generalist hat, but I can also wear my specialist hat. And so one of the things as I evolve and change my vision for the practice, 
I like the idea of doing these non-DPC services. So for example, besides the cannabis, uh, I do treatments for depression. Uh, I mentioned that I had done some medical weight loss. I didn't really focus on that early on, but now I've reintroduced that. So I'm doing medical weight loss. Again, I do all this stuff for my regular DPC patients at no charge, but for my non-DPC patients, it's something that I can do and not take insurance and do it as almost a specialty. And the latest thing, and this is literally as of the last week or so, is I've actually started to offer um, treatments for long COVID. You know, that's, to my knowledge, the only people that are doing this are the academic medical centers. There's a lot of people out there. And so on. And, and it just, it's, to me, it's interesting. So my sort of vision now is, is, is changed over time, but it's really to have my primary care practice, but some other things that I happen to be interested because I like to learn and, and do things. And my guess is it will change over time. Awesome. And Also, I love that you share that because that's encouragement to be okay with that too, right? Because I I totally feel that to my bones in terms of the the feeling of, I have a patient in five days because I'm opening my practice. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that given all of the stories we've heard, especially during the pandemic, where people have lost their jobs for whatever reason at a very, very quick turnaround they have chosen to do direct primary care. So I appreciate you sharing those words. Now, in terms of when you mention how you have your direct primary care practice patients and then the services that are included for them, but then you also have your non-direct primary care patients, how do you operate an onboarding when it comes to a non-DPC patient versus a DPC patient? Good. So that's a good question. So, I mean, I think DPC is part of this whole direct care movement. Again, the problems with most of our healthcare system, there are many, but health insurance is one of them. And so we have this direct specialty care movement, direct primary care movement. It's about direct care because it's it's a much it, taking that insurance middleman out of the picture. Now, DPC, when we think about DPC, we're generally talking about sort of DPC is the business model, sort of a monthly membership, no insurance. But there, and there are many ways to do that. Again, the, the doctors that I was going to buy the practice from, they were doing direct care and they were doing primary care. They weren't using the DPC model, but one could argue they were doing direct primary care. They were just doing it a different way, a cash fee for service way of doing that. So when it comes to my non-DPC patients, my non-membership patients, it's the same way. It's a cash fee for service, just like our direct specialty care colleagues would do. Very upfront with pricing. I create memberships for that. So for example, the medical cannabis, when you know I use Alation as my EMR, we onboard them the same way. And we just create a membership called medical cannabis. We and we don't bill them monthly, they just pay me the fee. And you know, I invoice them. That's a whole other conversation. We get to. I give them an invoice. Because I know I know that's a very touchy subject in the DPC world, but I'll give them an invoice to submit to their insurance company so that they can get reimbursed, which I think some of the, DP, the direct specialty care doctors will do. But I don't deal with the insurance at all. So it's a straight cash fee for service. Give them an invoice, but it's the same EMR. It's pretty much the same thing. It's just a different membership. And when you look at like your PNL, for example, do you have a certain number of patients that you put into your PNL or do you only put into your PNL your direct primary care patients? And then that's just diversifying on top of your PNL for the practice. It's very interesting. I think about it in a different way. I think of it as time. And essentially what I'm charging for is my time. And I only have so many hours of the day. So there is a reason why most concierge doctors and DPC doctors have about 500 patients. So in concierge, it's about 500. DPC, because DPC doctors don't promise the, the concierge level of services, so they can have a few more 600, 700 patients. But there's a reason why there's that subset. And so basically, when it comes from a business standpoint or from a PL standpoint, you basically figure out, all right, what are my overhead costs? How much am I going to charge for these 500 patients? And that's what it is. And how much salary am I going to make? And so most DPC practices can operate at, you know, like a 30% overhead, some even less. So you can, the numbers are not that hard. This is why this is not a very hard thing. It's really not, I mean, I don't even use the term, I mean, my accountant will tell me what my P&L numbers are, but I don't even look at those. I just know that what is my panel size going to be? So I think of it in a different term. So rather than have 500 member patients, I've decided I'm going to have 400 patients, 
okay? And I can see X number of, of medical cannabis patients a day. And as I start to expand my services, so I, I inherited a lot of, a lot of my DPC patients have come from concierge doctors who have retired. And so those patients are a lot older. So my attrition rate by natural causes is actually higher than I think your typical DPC. My, my oldest patient, who was 103 and change, just died the other day. So when he signed up, he was 101. So I had a feeling that he wasn't going to be a long-term patient. And so I have a lot of patients in their 90s and a lot in their 80s, but a bunch in their 90s and a few closing in on 100 and stuff like that. So my new sort of model is, is I will actually let my practice attrition to maybe even a smaller number as I start to add these services. I haven't quite figured out the exact balance of that, but it's really more of a time issue than a PL issue, if that makes sense. Love it. And I love that explanation. I think that especially for those people who might've started without a PL, it gives them a different way to think about things. Go well, okay, here's a, here's a, here's a free, a free sort of rule of thumb that I came up with for your podcast listeners that I think is very interesting. So if you do the math, if you go with 500 and you assume a 50 week year, you need two weeks to make the math easy. Hopefully it's less than 50 weeks, but to make the math easy, it's 50 weeks, 40 hour work week, that's 2000 hours, okay? So divided by 500 patients, that's four hours per patient. And that math seems to work out. So the way that I think about it is that my average patient, okay, is gonna, it's gonna be an hour for a physical, an hour for two follow-up visits, and then two hours of administrative time. And that's the average. Some patients, maybe I just see them for a physical once a year, and maybe they have no admin time. And some patients are high utilizers, and I'll see them several times, and I'll be on the phone prior authoring meds. And, but, but that average seems about right. So if you're trying to figure out panel size or how much you should charge, what you do is you take your membership, your annual membership, divide that by four, and that's your hourly rate. And that's basically what I do. So when I see a cannabis patient, that's to half an hour, okay? And so I'll take my hourly rate and divide that by half, and that's how much I charge them. And that's, that's the conversion of money versus time is that how many hours am I going to spend? And the one advantage of doing the non-DPC services, that's the way that you could convert money versus time. And one of the advantages is the non-DPC don't require those two hours of admin. They're just straight time. And so that's another advantage of doing non-DPC services is that you can free up some of that time. Super helpful takeaways. So thank you for sharing that. And when we talk about your practice, you've stopped accepting, I know you mentioned how you let your attrition rate go down a little bit. And then, so you can have the time to do non-DPC member care, but in terms of when you decided to lower that number to 400 and you closed your practice to, to new patients in your fifth year, tying back into vision as well, how did you come to deciding that 400 was the good number for you versus like 350? And then in terms of vision for the future, how do you reevaluate? Is it Q3 months or whatever to say, this is a good number as I've let my attrition go down and I've increased my cannabis patients or whatever other services to non-DPC members that you can find that happy place going into the future, given right. that you said vision can change all the time. Right. So I, I don't have a plan in which I say quarterly or annually or yearly, I sit down and go over everything and review that. I think that's a good idea, but that's not the way I, that's not my DNA. I don't do that. I'm constantly thinking about my practice, what I like, what I don't like, what could I improve? How could I do differently? What I might want to do. Some of that is influenced by my DPC colleagues. And one of the reasons why I like this social media is because I see what other people are doing. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. That's really unique and interesting. So as an example, I mentioned briefly, you know, that I'm starting to do some treatments for long COVID. Where that came from is I saw that some DPC doctors were doing some functional medicine and some alternative medicine. And again, I'm a traditional internal medicine academic full way and what's interesting is the cannabis thing sort of opened my mind to maybe some alternative things. And I saw some DPC doctors doing these kind of things. And I'm like, well, what's all this about? And asked some people and talked to them and started doing some research. And I'm like, hmm, this might be something that I want to do. 
And so my way of sort of dipping my toe into functional medicine is by doing long COVID because I think there's a, a huge need and it fits that paradigm. And so we'll see. So my vision is constantly evolving. Might I do more functional medicine stuff? I might, I don't know. But I'm thinking that sort of as I go through these things. So taking a step back, when I started this and had no vision, it was just sort of panic mode. How do I generate revenue? Oh, let's buy this machine and, and do some fat reduction. And hopefully that works to sort of happily landing on medical cannabis and deciding, you know, this is something that I want to incorporate. I really like helping people this way and doing something different than primary care, sort of finding the specialty. So that was sort of evolving. And, I, and as I was thinking about how am I going to incorporate these two things, I thought about this sort of time revenue standpoint and how did that work and sort of came up with this sort of four hour average number. And what was that balance going to be and how many patients were I seeing per week? And if I was seeing two cannabis patients a day, would, that would be the right balance. And doing some of that mathematics, that's where I, I came up with that. And in fact, you have to be very careful. So I actually purposely priced my fees for cannabis much higher than my competition because I only wanted to see, number one, I only wanted to see the real sick people and the people who really wanted a doctor. I didn't want to see the people who just wanted their certificate. I wanted to want someone who wanted clinical advice. So I priced myself that way. But I also like, I couldn't see 10 patients a day because that would take away from the time that I've promised my DPC. So to me, sort of, it was almost like an 80-20 rule and it seemed to work out really well. So I did a lot of these sort of napkin-based calculations and sort of 400 was seemed to be sort of the right number, but I also wanted to guarantee that 400. So I decided I built in a little buffer and originally I was going to be 410, but I bumped it to 420 because I thought it would be funny because of the cannabis. And so I, I came up with my 420 buffer and I did that for a while. And as I'm adding these new services, I sort of let that come down back to the 400. And that's sort of where I am now. And we'll see. And my guess is in a year from now, I'll pro hopefully be in a very different place. Now, I, I'm I'm going to laugh every time I see someone reference the 420 method <laughs> of Dr. Mintz on one of yeah. the DPC Facebook groups. I love that. And in terms of practicing in your geographic location, because you grew up around the area where you're practicing now, you practiced for so many years doing the one hour commute. If people are looking to open in the DMV area, what things would you challenge them to think about in terms of choosing a location, in terms of the cost of living, in terms of any legislative differences, because there's so many you know, different states and the District of Columbia all within that region of where you're practicing? So I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to generalize it. And the, what I mean by that is this is a good question for sort of everyone. And the point being is that the answer depends on your location. Now, if you're not wedded to a particular location, then you have a lot of flexibility. In other words, if you want to serve the underserved and not charge a lot of money and live in a rural area and that's what you want to do, that's fine. But if you live in the Virginia or Maryland suburbs of D.C., that's going to be hard to do. So a lot of questions you people ask you, how much should I charge? Should I get a loan? Should I do this? Should I do that? A lot of the answer is it depends on what your, what your practice vision is and where you live. Because your biggest expense, your biggest cost is going to be your staff and your rent. And that's going to be heavily influenced about where you are. So, the, so is $70 a month the right membership fee? The answer is it depends. What services are you offering? Where is your practice located? You know, et cetera. And so one of the challenges for DPC is sort of the value proposition because the access proposition is super easy. The, the value proposition is a little bit more challenging, but it depends on where you are. So getting back to your question, in my area, the, the Fairfax County and Montgomery County surround the District of Columbia. They're the two wealthiest counties or two of the wealthiest counties in the country. The biggest employer for the region is the federal government, which has amazing insurance benefits. So I live and work in an area that the penetrance of concierge medicine is much higher than the rest of the country. So I don't know what the national average is. Let's say it's 3% or 2%. And in our area, when I started, it's 5%. Now it's probably 6 or 7%. So to me, to try to open a, a DPC at $70 a month is not going to work. One, because I can't afford it because the rent's really high and my staff is really high. So that's out of the window. 
out of, that's not going to work. But also people have insurance and it's good. It doesn't, a lot of them, it doesn't cost a lot of money. And so like to try to sell them on not using their insurance is really hard. And they know what concierge is. The problem, the pain point, they can't find a doctor. No doctors in our area are taking new patients. There's no primary care physicians coming in. All the older doctors are leaving or retiring or going concierge. You cannot find a primary care physician in our area. And if you have one, forget about getting an appointment or physical or anything like that. So, so what I did is I wanted to start a DPC, but I basically just called myself a concierge doctor. I was already a true concierge doctor in my previous job. I'll just use that and market it. And when people ask me, how am I different from MDVIP, I can sort of explain what DPC is, but I don't even have DPC on my website. And again, part of that was because my kid was about to go to college in a couple of years and I had given notice and it didn't work out. So I had to be up and running pretty quickly. If I had left 10 years ago, I might've done things a little bit differently. So that one of my, you know, essentially is to think about those factors if you're starting in my area. And if you don't want to call yourself concierge and I totally, you know, as a current concierge, former concierge doctor. I understand that because like I said up front, I didn't want to be a concierge either. I want it. This is for everyone. I want to treat everyone. If you don't want to do that, one of the ways that I do is market yourself as concierge without the concierge price tag. And instead of trying to sell people on DPC, I do everything that a concierge doctor does. I'm just not going to charge you as much. And, and that would be sort of one piece of advice that I think will work very well in this area, but other areas as well. You know, anywhere that's a suburb or even in a major city, but that's probably not going to fly in middle America where insurance is a problem and people are not well insured, they're underinsured and cost is a big issue and they want you to buy the generics at cost and save a few dollars. That's not going to work in my area. So you really have to look at who are your patients, where are you working, where do you want to work, build your vision, and then those things dictate those decisions that people fret about. Awesome. And in terms of just putting some more details about your practice, the people who have found your value proposition insanely in alignment with what they wish to have as a as a healthcare access point, quality point, whatever you want to call it. You said that you have a higher number of people who are older in your practice, but in terms of the the patients, given that you are in the DMV area, I want to ask how many of your patients have that amazing federal insurance and still see you as their physician? A bunch of them do. I would say I have a lot of Medicare patients. Most of my patients are well insured. Now, you know, a lot of Medicare patients, either Medicare Advantage plans or straight Medicare, a bunch of federal employees or local government employees. Like, so for example, the school system has amazing insurance. So a lot of very well insured people and, and, you know, and they're happy. And the reason why they're happy to do that is because their insurance doesn't help them when it comes to primary care because there's just not enough of us around and they can't get the appointment. You know, they don't want to go to urgent care. They don't want to have to run to the emergency room. They don't want to have to wait three months for a physical. And it's a high pain point. It's a really high pain point. There are really no doctors. There are very few doctors to begin with in our area and no one's taking new patients. It's a real big problem. It's a huge problem. I had to point out to one of my new patients the other day that if they looked in the back of their insurance card, it said that this insurance does not guarantee healthcare. So it, it's so interesting that so many people believe in our culture that I have the magic card. I can swipe it like Dr. Jeff Gold says, just like that credit card. Now, so when you talk about access in your practice, one of the things that is featured on your website is that there's 24 seven access to telemedicine. And so in your years of practice, can you speak to the fear that some people might have? Like, I can't be on call as a solo doctor because I want to go on vacation or I want to do the things that I, I, I love like sleep. So how do you address the 24 seven access to telemedicine in your practice and how has it affected your life outside of your clinic? That's that's a great question. So again, going back 10 years ago or 15 years ago, when I decided to do the concierge practice as part of the academic practice, that was the first thing that my colleagues questioned me. Are you crazy? You're going to be on call all the time. And it was coming from the way we did. We didn't do any inpatient coverage. We were all we were about 20, 25 FTEs that covered the primary care patients for the faculty practice. So the faculty, the GW faculty practice 
is the largest multi-specialty group in the District of Columbia. At the time, there was 20 to 25 FTEs for primary care. The, the, the practice itself probably served about 30,000 patients, maybe more. So when you were on call, you were only on call twice a month. But when you were on call, you were on call for the entire practice, the entire 30,000 patients. And you, it was typically like a weekday and a weekend day. And so when you were on call at five o'clock, when the phones rolled over, the first 10 calls were, I called in this morning and my Lipitor wasn't called in and you need to call on my Lipitor now. So you were basically, you know, you had those string of phone calls and sometimes it was a busy middle of the night, but you were, you were stuck at your house. Or if you, it was your turn to do Saturday morning call, you couldn't really leave because there's all these calls. So even though you did call twice a month, it was hell for those two half days, twice a month. And what I found out was when I switched to the concierge, the opposite occurred, which is when patients have access to, to you during business hours, they don't bother you. And so I found that I almost never got called. And I was like, I am never going back. I could never do that again. It was, it was wonderful. And so part of this is setting up the expectations. And that's the key. And I do this at the meet and greet. So I do a meet and greet for every patient. And I set up these expectations at the meet and greet. Because that's the question that people ask, how can I reach you or on call or whatever? And so here's the spiel that I say. I say, if you're sick on Sunday and you want to come in on Monday, you don't have to call me on Sunday. My assistant gets in the morning, you call her in the morning, and we'll tell you when to come in. And if you have chest pain and can't breathe, you call 911. But if it's three o'clock in the morning, and you're not sure whether this can wait till tomorrow, or you have to go to the emergency room or don't know what to do, that's the kind of call that I want to take. And so when you say that to patients, they really get, okay, if it's really only, if it's a true, if I really don't know what to do, that's when I call Dr. Mintz. And I almost never get calls, almost never. The other half of that, and this is important, is I make sure that the business of today is done today. So if you call me or email me this morning, I don't leave the office until I've returned your call or returned your email. And does that mean sometimes I stay a tiny bit later than I would love to? Not usually, but it can. But I've sort of set that up as my mantra. And what that does, it affords me when I go home, I'm home. Like I don't even put my cell phone. I leave my cell phone upstairs. I can hear it ring, but I don't like carrying my cell phone around and stuff like that. And so I almost never get calls after hours on the weekends. And again, I've been doing this, this same thing for my five years in my DPC and 10 years before that in concierge. And it's great. It's fantastic. So I've done 24-7, 365 for 15 years. The exception was I had, I had an, a surgery, and so a couple of my colleagues had to cover for me for a couple of days. But other than that, I've been doing it forever, and it's been great. It's been wonderful. Awesome. And when it comes to testimonials, on your website, you have a whole section about testimonials. So especially for people who they might not be a direct primary care patient or looking to be a direct primary care patient, but even just a testament to you as a physician. You have many examples. How do you approach testimonials when you're reaching out to DPC patients versus your non-DPC patients? So I think this goes back to something that we talked about earlier, is that you don't need to know everything. You just need to know what you do know and what you can do, and you don't need help, and what you don't know and where you should get help, and whether it's worth paying that for a lot. So here's like, like again, I'll get to your question. I'll answer that question in a second, but I think this is a really important point based on comments that I see, you know, on, on some of the social media. Fortunately for DPC doctors, young DPC doctors, there's a ton of resources. There's kudos to Josh Umber and, and Atlas, and, and they have a lot of resources, and there's primers, and there's people that have written books about it. There's some really good books out there. Doug Fabrago has done that. There's a bunch of books out there that you can do. There's all these like DPC masterminds and conferences, and you can go to that. And everyone should do all those things if they're interested. But for some people, even that much, it's still overwhelming. And that's okay. Not everyone is a DIY kind of person. Not everyone's like that. And it's okay if you want someone to hold your hand. And it's okay to pay for that. Now, make sure that if you're going to pay for it, that you pay for someone who is a DPC doctor themselves who has done this, not some sort of medical consultant that knows the insurance world because the rules don't apply. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to pay for help. So 
I bring that up because I don't know anything about reputation management. I don't know anything about testimonials. The reason why that is so good is because, and this is interesting, this goes back to one of the perks of the big aesthetics machine was they gave me a website for free. That there was a lot of perks that came with it, and that was one of them. And, and I'll just say that the, the, the website is Patient Pop. That's the, the website I used. And they did such a good job with SEO. And again, if you don't know what SEO is, that's okay. You need to have good SEO. And if you don't know what that is, you could hire people to help you with that. And you go with a website like, like Patient Pop that does your reputation management and stuff like that. I didn't know anything about that. But Patient Pop is really good with SEO and really good with reputation management. And when patients book online, they get an email to say, did you like Dr. Mintz or not? And if you do, then you rate them. And so I've got this amazing you know, testimonials. The only testimonials that I ever saw is I thought it'd be a good idea to put like on my website two video testimonials. So I have that from when I first started. But everything else is all organic. I don't lift a finger. It's just done behind the scenes because you know, I have a website that knows how to do that. And it's interesting, most of my patients, even regardless of the service, whether it's for DPC or for medical weight loss, it's, I was Googling X, you came up, you looked very professional and you had amazing testimonials. And all of that's because I, I bought an expensive box that didn't work out, but got a free website and they did such a good job. I decided I would pay for that. And I pay for that now. And it's a good ROI because of exactly what you're saying. Awesome. And we'll make sure that the links to your book, the links to articles you've written, the links to the, the patient pop website is on your blog. So thank you so much, Dr. Mintz, for joining us today and sharing your story. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Next week, look forward to hearing from Dr. Brian Ostick of Health and Healing DPC in Woodland Hills, California. If you've enjoyed the podcast and you haven't yet done so, subscribe today and share the episode with a physician you may know who needs to hear about DPC. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify now as well as it helps others to find all these DPC stories. Lastly, be sure to follow us on social media. If you're wanting to continue learning more about DPC in the meantime, check out dpcnews.com. Until next week, this is Marielle Conception.